The, the idea of this series is that you and I would be pillars. You and I live in a world that is quite messy. It is not to be ominous, but it is dark and it is broken. But I believe that just like in those days of the audience of this scripture, that God would actually desire to create us and form us into being people, that when pain and when pressure comes, that we are not intimidated because we are made of some different stuff, that we're pillars. The word pillars, and for the, depth, for the, for the sake of this series, I'm gonna define it this way. It is an ordinary structure that can carry extraordinary weight. An ordinary structure that can carry extraordinary weight. I want to be the kind of people, I wanna be the kind of person, I want us to be the kind of believers. I want the men in here that are fathers, if you're a father, would you raise your hand? Raise your hand if you're a dad, okay? Raise your hand if, if, if you wanna be someday. Yes. So I want us men to be able to lead our homes and to be set examples in our community. And I want us to be, you gotta be kidding me. Why? I don't even, that's amazing. It's the Lord, okay. Do not disturb. Come on, Taylor. You, this has happened before, buddy. Okay. <laughs> that when that distraction comes, I'm not deterred. Okay. <laughs> but I wanna be that kind of person. That's, it's not if, but it's when pressure pushes down on you. That you are made of the stuff that though it might cause you to bend, you do not break. That's what I desire for you. I hope that the best is yet to come for our nation. And I also know that we're in weird times. There's disruption, there's wars, there's rumors of wars, there's resistance to Christianity today. There's all kinds of things that are raging against you having what it takes to withstand and to stay standing. And I know that God has given you all that you need so that you can be somebody who, like this scripture says that we're about to read, that you're esteemed as a pillar, that you are not easily broken. How many of you want that for your life? So Galatians chapter two and verse one. This is the apostle Paul. He's telling his story. And he, he says this in the second chapter of his letter to the Galatian church. He says, after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem this time I was with Barnabas. I took Titus also, and we went in response to a revelation and meeting privately with those esteemed as leaders, I presented to them the gospel that I preached to the Gentiles. I wanted to be sure that I was not running and had not been running my race in vain, yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom that we have in Christ and to make us slaves. In other words, they were trying to get in and get legalistic and say, this is what you need. I don't know if you've seen this online at all, is when you see people that cozy up a, a, an ideology, a, a conservative or a left kind of ideology, and they make that more important than the gospel itself. And what Paul is saying is they were coming in and saying, you need to be circumcised to get in. And Paul's like, no, 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 no. Jesus is all that we need. What he did on the cross, he, was, he died, he was buried, and he was ris risen to life. That is all that we need. There's nothing else that we need to do to earn our way into the family of God. But many people, they were so locked into automatically it must mean this, so there's no possible way that you could be uncircumcised and be part of the family. Now, we're not gonna talk about circumcision today. That is not the point of my message, but this matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom that we have in Christ and to make us slaves. We did not give in to them for even a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. As for those who were, again, held in high esteem, Whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. They added nothing to my message. On the contrary, they recognized 
that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised just as Peter had been to the circumcised. For God, who was at work in Peter as an apostle to the circumcised, was also at work with me or in me as an apostle to the Gentiles. James Cephas also known as Peter. This is the Aramaic version of his name. So James, Peter, and John, those, this is what I want to park on, those esteemed as pillars. They gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised, and all they asked was that we continue to remember the poor, the very thing we'd been eager to do all along. I want to focus on this this line, it's been intriguing me for a while, and it's gonna be the heartbeat for this series. Those esteemed as pillars. If you're taking notes, you can title this message today, The Making of a Pillar. The Making of a Pillar. I'd encourage you to take notes. I think it helps you to, to internalize and take in what we talk about on a Sunday morning. We don't wanna just be people who have it go in one ear, it feels good, and then it's out the other by the time we leave the building. And I cannot tell you how many times I go back to my scripture, go back to my Bible. It is full of underlines and notes in my journal. And I can say that date, I wrote that, God spoke that to me, that stuck out to me, and I can go back to it. So you might say, I'm not a journaler. I want to challenge you. Yes, you are. So bring a Bible and bring a journal. Let's pray. God, thank you for uh, your word. Would it take root in our lives today? Let us be those that in 2024 and beyond would be those that when others, believers and non-believers, when they look at our lives, they would say, that person's strong. I wanna be around them. That person does this right. I I wanna follow them. That person sets a great example. I wanna follow in their footsteps. God, may that be said of us. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Amen. You ever found something that is, uh, that was too good to be true? Anybody? I remember when when we were kids, uh, grew up on the East Hill of Kent, and we were, we, we, we were going to move, um, actually, we were moving from the West Hill to the East Hill, and uh, we, we found this house. I was about nine years old, and we found this house that we were maybe going to move into. We were looking to buy a new house, and, and uh, we, <laughs> I was nine. Uh, so we found this house, and I remember we pulled up to it, and this house, I was really nerdy about square footage, and this house had like 300 more square feet than our last house, so I was stoked that we, had, we were getting more square footage. And we, we, we went into the house, and this house was so cool. It was an old house, but it, was, it looked really, it had character to it. And I remember, I, if you've ever been a kid and you've moved, what's the first thing that you do when you run into a house that might be yours? What's the first thing you do? You go to your room. So you go find which room is mine. Now, I'm the oldest, so clearly I get the biggest room. So I run up there, and this room is, I'm telling you, in my nine-year-old brain, it was the size of this sanctuary right here. <laughs> this room was massive. I could, have, I could have seven bunk beds, and I could jump from one to another. I could put a trampoline in there. This was going to be the most epic room that I've ever lived in. I was so stoked about it. But not only that, the cherry on top of this house is there was a swimming pool. There was a swimming pool at this house, and we were like, oh my gosh, we are going to move to luxury. We're getting a brand new house. I got a room the size of a city, and we got a a swimming pool. There's nothing wrong with this house. Mom and dad, let's move tomorrow. I remember being so excited, and we were all, I mean, the whole family, we were floored. This was going to be our new house. And I remember driving home, and, and we're asking my parents, are we going to get this house? They're like, I think so. We're going we're gonna to put an offer in on it. And we, I, I went to bed, and I'm telling you, I still remember this. I'm not making it up. I had a dream about living in this house that night. I was dreaming about this house. It was ours. It was mine. I was naming it and claiming it. I was, I was believing that this was coming my way because God favored me and he loved me at my nine-year-old self. He loved me so much. He was giving me this house until someone inspected it. That's the nasty thing, isn't it? That when somebody with an eye to see what you can't see comes in and they start saying there's some things wrong about this place that if you buy this house, you're gonna be upside down and you won't even be able to move into it. The roof was bad, 
The foundation was bad, the beams were bad, the flooring was bad, and we had such rose-colored glasses that all we saw was the swimming pool, the large rooms, the new kitchen, the beautiful colors, the character to the house. But what this person with a critical eye came in and saw is all of the things that were wrong with it. And I remember just being so bummed when I found out we were not moving into this house. It looked good but it was actually uninhabitable. And it's funny because oftentimes we'll do that, right? You ever, you ever had a situation like that where you were glossing over things that you knew were probably there, but you didn't want to admit it to yourself because you were so locked into a picture that you had that there was, you would do anything that you could to maintain that picture. And I, I remember recently talking with somebody whose job it is uh, to inspect Uh, completed like construction projects and things like that. And their job is to make the lives miserable of the people who are building it. (laughs) Their job is to, I mean, they said something to the the effect of, it is my job to make it as difficult as possible to let them finish. Now, that might sound to you like a miserable person, but he said, so that when they're finished, they can trust that it's safe. Safe because I'm able to see what they cannot see and the longevity of this structure depends on the testing that I put them through. The longevity of the structure depends on the testing that they go through. The longevity of your life and your faith, your faithfulness to God, your ability to follow Jesus is directly tied to how much pressure you can withstand how much pain you can endure and not quit. I've been asking myself, what did it take for these New Testament believers to get to this place where the Apostle Paul, arguably one of the greatest people to ever have lived other than Jesus himself, would say about these people and would hear and assess that these people are what it says, regarded or esteemed as pillars. What was it? about Peter, James, and John, and others in that community, the Christian leaders, what was it that made Paul say that they were esteemed as leaders? That word esteemed as leaders or esteemed, sorry, as pillars, it means this. Those who have been observed up close and considered to be proven worthy to carry weight. Those who have been observed up close, not from afar, if you... If you see my grass from afar, it looks real green and well manicured, but you get up close, there's little spots that I can't get grass to grow. I don't know why, but I do it every year and then it it does it again. But when you look from afar, it looks great. But when you get up close, you realize there's flaws. When those who have been observed up close, where I can see the nitty gritty, the insides, the 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 things about the day-to-day life and the, the habits and the attitudes when you've been observed up close and in that moment, consider to be proven worthy to carry weight. Pillars and columns in in the Greco-Roman world were significant. And uh, I would love to go over there someday and just and view it. Go to go to Jerusalem or go to Rome. Go to these places where these ancient buildings, some of them are still standing or pillars are still standing. They were very important to that to that world because the quality and the opulence, what it did is it sent a message to the region and to the city, those who lived in it and those who were around it, a, a message of strength. Like the, the, the size of the building had a direct correlation to the strength of the military might. So the power of a city or power of a, of a nation or power of an our army or military was often directly correlated to the size and the opulence of the buildings that they would build. So a weak military, a weak nation or weak leaders might have buildings that are also weak. But a strong one, a strong one, they would have this, these massive, they build statues and, and monuments and they build these opulent buildings and it was to communicate something to the people in the region there and communicate something both to the insiders and the outsiders. We are strong, you cannot defeat us. 
So the large building with wide pillars, it would send that symbol of strength. And oftentimes, even when, when, uh, when a, uh, an army or a military would go into another city and, uh, and battle or another nation, they'd fight. A lot of times they would even unnecessarily demolish buildings as if to say, we are demolishing what used to communicate your strength. We wanna take it down. We want to communicate that you no longer have might. And as long as your buildings are standing, there's a remnant of the power you used to have. So they would knock down the pillars. They would demolish the buildings. They would burn them up. They would, they would take them down because they wanted to communicate that their power is no longer. So the stronger the pillar, the stronger the pillar, the larger the building could be. Thin pillars might have small buildings. Large pillars, large columns, they could carry a lot of weight. And the larger the building, the stronger the message it sent. So it's fascinating that Paul here uses language. He says, those esteemed as pillars. Those esteemed as culture setters. Those esteemed as people that are strong, that they can carry weight, that they set the culture. This is the kind of people that they were. They were culture setters. They, they, they were dependable. They were immovable. They were leaders. They were full of integrity. They were people who were driven to prayer. They didn't shrink back when there was a, a threat. They, they would stand up to evil. They, would, they were full of the spirit of God. These were the people that were pillars. So when Paul's referring to them, he's saying, you are the people that when people look at the Christian community, they look at you as the ones that are holding it up. You are the fathers and the mothers who when that community, when you're there, it's better. That when you're there, there's, there's more life in the room. When you're there, there's safety for the next generation. When, when you're there, there's something different in the culture. And when you're absent, there's something missing. And this is what people that are pillars are, is that when they're in the room, when they're in the city, the city's better. The room is better. The church is better. The family's better. The friendship is better because they're a pillar that not to say that you carry all the weight, but you can carry some weight and carry some pressure. You are there to set the culture. Are you with me today? Now you might say, why does this matter? This matter because just like in those times, we live in a day that requires that you and I become pillars. The day to day no longer allows for any room for you to be weak. Now, I'm not saying that you need to be strong in some sort of external way, but that you would have the fortitude spiritually, emotionally, and otherwise, that you'd be the kind of life that when pressure comes to you or when it's around you, that you do not fold to it. Yeah. The day to day, it requires that you be a pillar. Right. You don't like it? Well, friend, I don't know what you're doing because it is miserable out there sometimes. <laughs> it is dark but I don't take my cues from that. I just get stronger in the Lord so that when that stuff comes, I'm not intimidated. It might cause me to bend. It might be a little bit hot. It might be a little bit difficult, but it's not gonna take me out because my strength is, is there. I'm, I'm growing and I'm, 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 I'm the kind of person that's not weak, but I'm, I'm big. I don't know, I'm not big. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not small, but that I, I'm big inside that God's developing me and he's shaping me and I've got character and he's, and he's forming me and he's molding me and I'm the kind of person that anything that comes, that bad news comes my way and it doesn't take me out. I'm not shocked. I'm not hurt by it. I keep going because I am strong. That is what I desire for my life. That's what we desire for our lives, that we would be pillars. Turn to your neighbor and say, you gotta be a pillar. So how do we get there? I wanna give you... I wanna give you four stages. I wanna give you the stages to becoming a pillar, stages of making a pillar. And the first stage is the, the molding stage. Now, I got an object lesson today. This is Play-Doh Play from my house. Whenever we do clay or Play-Doh stuff as a family, Noelle's actually really good at it. And my kids are actually pretty good. I am just awful. I am just, I'm not good at this. So please don't judge. Um, I could make just like a column, but it's, it's just gonna, yeah, I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna make a person, okay? I'm gonna make a person. 
So the molding stage, what it was, is oftentimes when developing a structure of any kind, maybe it was a monument, maybe it was a, a statue of a, of a leader in that day, perhaps it was a column or a pillar or, or a building. A lot of times what they would do is they would, before making the real thing, they would make a model. So what they would do is they, they might get some clay and even to this day, this will happen, is they'll, they'll make a clay model. This is, this is a person. <laughs> Camera, can you zoom in on... Uh, here, I'm going to make... No. <laughs> his, his arms are longer than his legs at this point. Okay. That's pretty good, right? Is that okay? Um, but they, they would make a model, and the model would serve as something that they could tweak, and they could bend, and they could mess with it, but the model then would exist to be a picture for what they were building when it came to building the real thing. You and I, as believers, we ultimately have Jesus as a model, and one of the things that we know that Paul would say is he would say to his protégés, he would say to his followers, follow me as I, what? This is the participation portion. If you know that and you didn't speak back to me, I'm kidding. Follow me as I, what? Follow me as I, what? Follow Christ. Paul was saying, follow me as I follow Christ. In other words, let me be a model for what it means to follow Jesus. You need a tangible, real life, right here, right now picture of what it is that you're going after. Paul had walked at this point for years with Jesus, and so he's able to model to those coming after him, this is what it looks like. You and I need a model. You need somebody or something that you are modeling your life after, that you can look at the mold and say, what is it that I can learn from that person so that I can follow Jesus too? I remember as a teenager and even today that I, I had people that I was modeling my life after. I know that in this season, I've been, I, I spent years in youth ministry and in my first, even my first week in youth ministry, I visited a youth ministry that I'd heard about. I met with the youth pastor and I said, I wanna model my life after you. I wanna follow what you did. Much of what I did in the first five, 10 years of youth ministry was because of what I learned from this person and other people like him. I was modeling after something. Even over the last couple of years as we began to transition into a new seat where we take the leadership of this church, what was I doing? I was calling up, texting, meeting with, getting lunch, getting coffees with as many people as possible who had done what I did. They spent years in youth ministry. They transitioned in to leading a church that had been led faithfully by a founder. So I was finding people like that. I found people who had taken churches from their dads, like I did, and I'd sit with them and I asked them all the critical questions. I could, I could open up about what I was feeling, what I was scared about, all of those things. What was I doing? I was finding models. I was finding models, but you know what happens? If you stay in model land, you can get coffee with 900 people and learn 900 theories, but at some point you have to get out of the mold stage. Some of us, we've been staring at molds for way too long. It is time to look at the mold, say, I got, you got a strong family? I want to raise my kids just like you did. You, you're good with your money? I want to be too. How did you start tithing? Because I can't see a way to do it, but you did it when you were 20 and you had nothing to live on, and you did it, and now God's been faithful over 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years. What did you do? I want to learn from you, but there comes a point where you get beyond just the vision of the mold and start saying, I'm going to enter the next stage. The next stage is the removal stage. See, it goes from that first stage, that first stage, which is the molding stage, to the second stage, which is the moving stage. Now, I would have tried to make a dinosaur. Well, you know what? I probably could. Because <laughs> this is a dinosaur. $2 at Walmart, not, not bad. Okay, so let's see if I can make a dinosaur. Let's see, dinosaur. What kind of dinosaur should I make? What's the ones? Wow. 
That's my dinosaur. Okay. Move over, Pastor Steve. I've got the object lessons now. <laughs> but they get the mold, whether it's a, a sculpture or a pillar, they get the mold, but then it was time to get the rock out of the quarry. It was time to get the actual materials that were going to be used to make the thing that they were making. See, the mold is nice, but it serves only as a picture. It's not the real thing. If all we ever do is have a picture of what we want, but we don't take steps to actually get it, then all we're doing is watching and we're not participating. And what we have to do is we have to enter into participation mode. I see what I want. I've got a picture of it. I even wrote it down, but now I'm going to make a commitment. I'm going to get the rock out of the quarry. That takes time. You get the rock and you realize, okay, this still has yet to be a pillar or in this case, a beautiful dinosaur. So what I have to do is I've got to get the rock out of the quarry, move from having a picture to taking a tangible step. I'm not going to just talk about it, but I'm going to be about it. I'm not just going to talk about, I need to get back into church and get closer to God again. I'm going to show up to church. Ha! Imagine, imagine what that could do if it compounded over time where you said, I'm going to make a commitment to being about something. I'm going to show up to church and I'm going to preemptively remove excuses from my mind as to why it goes nine weeks before I can show up again. And I'm not here to say that you not showing up is your righteousness or how you earn favor with God. No, of course not. That's not how God rolls. God did enough. And even if these people today, they might have, in these days, they might have had arguments about that. You need to show up on time this many times in a row for you to get into the family of God. You need to be circumcised. You need to, you need to you read your Bible well, and you need to do all this kind of stuff so you can be in the family. And God's, Paul's like, no, bro. Jesus did what you needed so that you could be in the family. You believe in him, you are in the family. You never show up again, but you believe in God. Can I tell you that God, like Noel said earlier, he's chasing after you. You are in his family, you belong here. He is your God, he loves you. You are in the family, you are welcome. And it is time to make a commitment. It's time to make a commitment to take a step. I'm gonna show up. I'm gonna honor God with what I watch. I'm gonna stop watching filth. I'm gonna stop scrolling until I, my brain just explodes in despair. I'm gonna make a commitment. I'm gonna stop doing those things. I'm gonna read my Bible daily. I'm gonna throw away my vices. I'm gonna give God leadership over at my stewardship. I'm gonna change my inputs and my habits. I'm gonna study scripture. I'm gonna grow. I'm gonna serve at the storehouse. I'm gonna join a team. I'm gonna start mentoring. A I don't know what it is. I'm gonna show up at work. To show up for my family. I'm gonna stop, you know, having nine drinks every night until I, you know, then sleep until 10 in the morning because I can and then, and then my kids don't get the best of me. And I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna make a commitment to change something. I'm getting the rock out of the quarry. I'm saying, God, I want to be formed into something. Are you with me? Some of us, we've been staring way too long at the model and we haven't even taken the rock out. The model is good. Recalibrate. Get, get, go look at that again. Absolutely. Write it down. But make a commitment. Get the rock out. All right. This is going to be the rule that I live by. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to make this change. I'm gonna make, and, and you know what? We, we sometimes will diminish our own efforts and desires and things like that. It is a good thing. But what, what it is, is I've got a picture of what I want. I'm going to take a step. I'm going to make a commitment. But then we move into the third stage. The third stage is the roughing stage. Will you remind me to sweep later? Because I'm going to make a mess. Um, so the roughing stage is, that's hard. Because there's a dinosaur in here. There's a pillar in here. But all you see is a little rock. But in the roughing stage, what would happen is there was breaking off of things. There was pressure and pain, but that is in efforts to get something out of this thing that needs to come out. Yeah. This is where large chunks might be broken off, but it only comes from digging. Like, imagine this in your back, right? Ouch, ooh, that was a good chunk. But you dig in there, you cut it out, right? 
You made the commitment, but then you, you're starting to feel it. You took a step. Oh, that hurt. I couldn't afford that, but I did. Oh, that, that. I lost some momentum, but I kept going. Made a mistake, but I repented this time, and I'm taking steps to get better. I, I said that thing, but I went back to that person and said I was wrong. Oh, my gosh. I, I, I got busy, but I recalibrated. I didn't live in shame. I didn't stay in that mode because I know that that's the old me. So I just got back up and I realized that my earning of this thing has nothing to do with whether God made me righteous. So I don't have to, I don't have to prove anything to him, but I'm living in the place where he proved it to me so I, can, I just can keep going. So I, I, I'm, I'm getting the pressure. Oh, I, I made a mistake again. Fatal flaw, fatal failure, but I'm still somehow here. So what happens is there's large chunks being broken off. And in the breaking off, in the recalibration, in the finding a mentor and chasing them down rather than blaming them for not pursuing you enough, but you chase them down and you set the appointment and you take their advice and you take steps, what happens is the chunks start breaking off and it's painful, but you're getting closer to the picture that you want. Are you with me today? And what happens is we got to get into the roughing stage where we give God permission to shape and to form us. Why is it hard to do all of the right things? That's the age old question that even Paul who wrote this had. Why is it that I don't do what I want to do? I should have brought an extra outfit. (laughs) Why is it that I don't do what I want to do and I do what I don't want to do? The apostle Paul, in my mind, second greatest person to ever have lived, is saying, I suck at this. That's how he's, but what we're doing is we're saying, God, I want you to, in the process of my life, I want you to form and to shape me. I want want you to help me to be disciplined and I'm gonna grow in this area and I'm gonna stop making excuses for, for not being a part of this and I'm gonna start reading my Bible, I'm gonna grow. And it's not about what your performance is, but it's about what it will do in you when you commit. Are you with me today? That it goes from the model stage and, and goes into the stage where you pull it out, but then you allow God to shape you. And if you've got pressure in your life, perhaps it's an invitation to see how God is using it to shape you, right? Nobody likes the last few years, it was weird. I didn't like it, but I love what it formed in me. I loved what God used to, to shape and to change and to make me softer in areas, make me firmer in areas and make me more principled in areas. I'm so thankful for it because it was God saying, I'm gonna use some inconvenience. I'll do it on the side. I'm gonna use some failures. I'm gonna use some past uh, habits that you had. And, and even in those, my power was made perfect in your weakness. And I'm gonna shape you and mold you because there's somebody I'm creating you to be. I'm making you into a pillar that when people come around you, they can say, that person's been through some stuff and they're still here. I wanna get around them. That person who's failed, that person who came back after divorce, that person who lost a business and then created a new one when they could have just been down for the count and quit, that person, oh, look, 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 there's something here now. It's, I I did pretty good, same color, and it's a mystery. So I think that was the Lord. Are you with me? Where God, this is what it is, is you're giving God permission to form you. If you want to be a pillar, you must give God permission to bring pain into your life and not whine at him when he does it, but instead say, God, thank you that when I endure trials of many kind, it makes me perseverance and it gives me endurance and it gives me strength and gives me fortitude and gives me grace for others when they're in their process. It is shaping and forming and molding me into being somebody who can carry weight and handle pressure. This is the roughing stage, but then there's another stage. And this is called the refining stage. If you could look up close, I had a backup. This is a pink dinosaur. If you look up close, the dinosaur is out, but there's still, there's some clay in there. And what has to happen in the refining stage is you gotta dip it into the water got to loosen up some of the finer parts and get in the crevices. 
you got to actually give not only God permission to have access to the whole of your life, but to every hour of your day. Not to just the general stewardship of your life, but to every penny of your finances. Not to just the general, I'm a good person now, but to your daily, hourly attitudes and responses when your kids take something out of your room. And when they spill water all over their floor and then it smells in their room because they were trying to make a pond. And then you react in a way that says, that's not how Jesus would react if he were me. Yet that's how I'm reacting right now. Whoa, that must mean God's still got to refine me. Wait, 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 wait. I'm 39. I've been following Jesus for as long as I can remember. I have yet to perfect this thing. I've got three kids. They're wonderful. I have yet to perfect this fatherhood thing. I've got uh, almost 16 years of marriage under my belt. I've got a great marriage, and yet I have yet to perfect this thing. Noel's closer than I am, but <laughs> what is God doing? He's still refining me. Yeah. Attitudes, buddy. Attitude. Patience. <clears throat> Compassion. You saw that person the other day, and you were quick to make assumptions about who they were. Wow. That's my son. And so what is he doing? He's refining the little things. And sometimes this isn't blunt force, but it's a minute by minute thing. And it's getting into the micro areas of your life. This is where maturity comes. It's not just where you can endure a big picture season that was hard, but it's in the daily moments where God got access to you and you didn't wince where you said something and immediately the Holy Spirit brought it to your remembrance or he called you out. He said, whoa, 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 that wasn't like you. And you follow it up immediately with say, hey, son, I'm sorry that I reacted that way. That's not what I want to be. What is it? It's the little refining moments where God convicts you of something and you don't spend a lot of time dancing around it. You just say, okay, God, thank you. Okay, okay, I'm gonna make a commitment. I'm gonna tell my wife. I'm gonna be honest about this with my friend. I'm gonna confess my sin. I've been doing a pretty good job. I feel great about my life. I'm heading in the right direction. I love God. I'm faithful in this, that, or the other thing. I feel like a pillar. And yet there's a crack right here that I want God to have, God to have access to. This is the refining stage where you give God access to every moment of your life where he begins to make you holy. He begins to make you clean and whole and aware of him. First Peter 2 in verse 4 says, as you come to him, the living stone, Jesus being the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God, precious to him, you also, similar language here, are like living stones being built into a spiritual house. That you might be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. This is painful, it is exhausting, and yet it is so necessary. Why? Because you were meant to carry something. I'm gonna call you up today. Call you men up. Call us up. It is time to start being pillars. To swallow our pride, have some humility and say, God, you brought me here for such a time as this. I'm gonna step up. I'm gonna be disciplined. I'm gonna follow you. And that in doing so, as we give God access to the daily, to the hourly, to the minute by minute, second by second moments, that God shapes and forms us into being, what he says, a royal priesthood that can house the presence of God. This is the fifth, the bonus stage. I call it the pillar stage. The after inspection, you're ready to carry some weight. On, on Wednesday nights, if you've ever been here on Wednesday night, that's super fun and um, What's super fun, one time we had an invite night, and 
you do this any, any Wednesday night, but I went downstairs during worship and students are dancing around. I was there a couple weeks ago and students are dancing around. I go underneath during worship and you can see the beams flexing. We've got a basement under here. We're not on concrete here. And there are beams that go right ac straight across the whole basement here. They're thick beams. And if you were to look at them right now, they're, they, they're sitting still, they're fine. But when there's worship and dancing, these beams flex. It is freaky. I'm telling you, if you, want, if you want to get freaked out, come here on a Wednesday night during worship and go downstairs. And while they're jumping around, you're going to see these beams flex. But I remember years ago, an engineer came and he said, oh, no, no, no. Those beams, they were made to flex. They were made to flex. And in fact, their flex is proof of their strength. That you can see how they were designed and what they are there for is that when they flex, that they are not able to break. And here's the thing. I think there's some people in here today that you've been bending and flexing and it's actually proof that God placed you here for such a time as this, that when you bend, that when you flex, when you've got some pressure, it has not taken you out. You might feel weak, you might feel the, the heat, you might feel the weightiness, but you are still here. Why? You were made to flex, you were made to bend, but you will not break when you are in God. You've got all that you need. God has made you for this time to be a pillar that when the weight of the world, when your failure, when your past comes creeping in, when the things out there are coming against you, that you are not broken. You are pressed, but you are not crushed. You are persecuted, but you are not abandoned. You are struck down, but you will not be destroyed. Why? Because you are in Christ. You are a pillar. What's my vision for me? What's my vision for you? What is my hope for you as a congregation? Be a pillar. It's time to be a pillar. It's time to stop dancing around it and saying, I wonder, no, 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 no. Today is the day. We got a broken world, but I'm not gonna spend much more time talking about the broken world. I wanna spend more time about what does it look like for God to develop me, to be somebody that when people come running from the broken world into the city of refuge, that they can take that refuge and be safe because there's people like me and people like you inside saying, you can come under our tent. You can come into our environment. We're strong here. We're strong, not in and of ourselves, but in God. So come one, come all. I believe that the harvest is coming. I believe that people are gonna find salvation and come in and return. The prodigals are gonna come home. They're gonna come into this house and they're gonna find some pillars that say, I've been through it, but I'm still here. I've been through it, but I'm still here. I've had some pressure, but I'm still here. I failed and I failed again, but God redeemed my life and I'm still here. We're pillars. Friends, it is time that we enter to the pillar stage. First Chronicles 16.9 might be Second Chronicles. It says, the eyes of the Lord look to and fro. They roam to and fro throughout the whole earth, seeking those who he can show himself strong on behalf of. Seeking those who as he puts weight on them, they may bend, but they will not break because they are rooted in God. How many of you wanna be a pillar today? How many of you, you wanna be a pillar for your family? Raise your hand. Would you stand with me? How many of you wanna be a pillar for your neighbors? Come on, would you raise your hand with me? How many of you wanna be a pillar for your workplace? How many of you wanna be a pillar of, of the light of God in a dark world? Come on, would you raise both hands to heaven? Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna sing these words. Jesus, you're not done with me. And if you're saying, you know what? I felt the pressure, but I'm ready to enter into the refining stage. Let God develop me and change me and grow me and mold me and shape me. Come on, would you lift both hands together and let's sing, Jesus, you're not done with me. You're doing a new thing. You're shaping me. You're molding me. Come on, can we sing it out together? You're not done with me.
me. Come on, he's doing a new thing. in this season, would you lift your hand? Just keep your hand lifted. If you, if you need to be strong for your kids, would you raise your hand? If you want it to be said of you 20, 30, 50 years from now, that you're still strong in the Lord, following Jesus, leading people, loving people well, would you lift your hand? Lord, I thank you, God, that as you see us, you see pillars. You see praying mothers who hit the ground on their knees daily for their kids. God, you see fathers who desire to exemplify what it means to be a strong man in 2024 to their kids. God, you see young people who they're still rooted in the house of God even though the world rages against Christianity. Lord, we pray for an infusion of your spirit. God, to give us strength when we are weak, when we feel powerless, your power is made perfect in our weakness. So I pray for every weak person today. I pray for every struggling person today, every person who thinks I've been disqualified. God, I thank you that it is not us who qualified ourselves, so it is not us who will disqualify ourselves. Your gifts and your calling uh, th that you gave to us, God, before we ever breathed our first breath, God, th those are without repentance. God, those are not going away. You've called us, so God, would you draw us back in by your voice today that we would step forward, God, into whatever stage that it is in, God, that for some of us, step one is to find somebody that we can mold our lives after. God, to identify a picture. For some of us, God, it's to begin to take a step, make a commitment. God, for some of us, it's to allow you to form us. God, for some of us, we already feel strong, but it's the little areas. It's the little things that we haven't given you access to. But whatever stage that we're at, we thank you that it is your Holy Spirit that brings us forward. So would you draw us forward, Lord? God, would you give us grace in the moments where we feel extreme pain and pressure, that you might form us into your image, God, into being, as your scripture says, royal priests who can house the presence of God pillars, God, that people run to and find safety. You know, we're going to spend some time over the next few weeks talking about pillars, and, but I even believe that today that there are some of us in here who need to make a commitment to say in this year, my, not only in action, but in your spirit and your attitude, your heart your fears, your worries, that you are immovable, 
that you're going to be somebody who's firmly planted, not easily moved by the winds of what we're seeing in the world. I want to encourage you to make that decision today. You will have opportunities to go back on it, but you're a pillar. You can withstand pressure. God's forming you. And God is the one who is strong when you are weak. Amen? Come on, amen? Hey, our prayer partners are going to be right up here. Maybe you made a commitment today to take that step. Best thing you can do is come and find one of these people and say, hey, would you seal this with me? Help me to take that next step. Maybe you need prayer for something unrelated. We would love to pray with you, help you to take that next step. We love you. Hey, God bless. We'll see you next week.
Except for a heart singing hallelujah, Darkness, but you're 